Now, the important thing about dinosaurs is the fossils showed that Tyrannosaurus rex was almost definitely uh, had a bunch of bones, which it does. Uh, and it's from these fossils, from bones, and occasionally other types of fossils, like bite marks or footprints and so forth, that we can reconstruct how these animals lived. And importantly, how they were different from other related animals. Because not only are we interested in how they operated, we're interested in how they operated in a different fashion from other types of creatures. Just as today, yes, it's interesting to see how, say, a lion works. But it's also interesting to see how a lion differs from a hyena, from a tiger, versus a bear, or whatever. So I'm going to do a lot of comparisons between tyrannosaurs, like T-Rex here, and other types of carnivorous dinosaurs, like Giganotosaurus here. These are shown uh, at the same scale to each other, on the larger than life size shown here. So some of the things that make tyrannosaurs different, well, you know, minor things or things that are seemingly minor to most of us, like the, the nasal bones along the top of the snout are fused together. They're not separate like they are in most animals. They, T. rex and its uh, relatives have these Premaxillary teeth, the teeth in the front of the snout, are actually um, basically incisors, which is rare for a dinosaur. Most dinosaur incisors look like the teeth behind them. Um, but in tyrannosaurs, they're different. They're little scraping teeth. They're not biting teeth, they're for scraping. We actually have bones of duckbills with scrape with, uh, straight marks on them. Probably used to help clean that last bit of meat off the bones. Um, and with that, when these teeth were first found, they didn't even recognize they were dinosaur teeth. They were, thought that they were evidence of pig-sized mammals from the late Cretaceous, from the end of the age of dinosaurs. Uh, but behind those are more typical uh, biting teeth. Although they're actually quite different from most carnivorous dinosaur biting teeth. Uh, and this is the view you know, no animal would want to see at the Cretaceous, <laughs> the open mouth of a uh, tyrannosaur coming at you. So if you look at those teeth, the teeth of a typical meat-eating dinosaur is like a blade. It's like a steak knife. It's a cliche. Mouths full of steak knives. They're flat from side to side. They've got serrations, knife edge coming up the front and going down the back. Tyrannosaur teeth aren't like that. They're actually very thick from side to side. They're not like knife blades. Uh, they're actually shaped kind of like bananas. They do have serrations on them, so they're like a knife-edged banana, but otherwise they're still pretty, pretty much bananas. <laughs> on top of that, or I should say below that, uh, the crown, so the crown is the stuff that sticks above the gum line, is about the same length as the root in a typical meat-eating dinosaur. But in tyrannosaurs, the crown is only one-third of the total length. So they're very thick, very deeply rooted teeth, and whereas these are knives, so an allosaur, a megalosaur, and so forth had a mouthful of stick knives. Tyrannosaurs did not. They had a mouthful of knife-edged bananas. Well, what could that be used for? Uh, well, there's other things to look at in the skull to try to figure that out. And one thing that differs between tyrannosaurs and typical meat-eating dinosaurs is tyrannosaurs had a hard palate. So, you know, you stick your tongue up behind your teeth, and you got a hard palate of bone there. So to us, that's normal. To an alligator or crocodile, that's normal. But to a lizard, and in fact to most types of uh, reptiles, that's not the case. There's no hard palate over there. So like that lizard doesn't have a hard palate there. But what is that for? Among other things, the palate is used to help transmit forces through the skull, either biting on just one side, uh, or holding on to something while twisting or turning, or where the thing you're holding on to is twisting and turning, it helps redistribute the forces. And those, those fused nasals certainly help in that context as well. Um, in the case of other types of meat-eating dinosaurs, they don't have that ability to help transmit the forces. And so their teeth are less good at holding, grasping, and turning. What they were really good at is simple compression, biting and slicing. And in fact, the, bite, uh, the bites of things like Allosaurus have been modeled to uh, seem to be very similar to the bite of something like a falcon. Uh, to bite in there and slice off, bite in and slice off, and not really hold on to the prey with their skull. Tyrannosaurs are different. They could bite on, hold on, twist and turn, and pulverize with those giant uh, piercing teeth. So we say that Tyrannosaurs have puncture and pole biting, and other typical meat eaters have bite and slice biting. 
based on the physical structure of the skull. It would be nice to have independent evidence of that. And in fact, there is. Uh, among some lines of evidence, there are specimen, there's a specimen of Triceratops where the horn was bitten off and healed. So it was bitten off while a live animal, still alive, and healed over, and the punctures in it matched the teeth of Tyrannosaurus rex, the only large predator in its environment. Um, so that, that thing that everyone has ever done with plastic dinosaurs, and that's make your Tyrannosaurus here Triceratops fight, really happened. <laughs> um, on top of that, we actually have specimens of duckbill dinosaurs, where some of their tail bones had been munched on and ripped out and rehealed. So we know that a Tyrannosaur went after those. Um, and we have stuff that came out the far end. We actually have fossilized Tyrannosaurus poop. Um, so we call them coprolites, which is just you know scientific pseudo Latin for crap stone. Uh, those, those. Uh, which in the kids' case, it's a about two liters big. So picture a two liter bottle. Uh, since the only large meat-eating dinosaur in the environment in which it's found is Tyrannosaurus rex, uh, the next largest meat-eater had a torso of about two liters. And so this was a really bad day for that one. Um, this is from T-Rex. Uh, inside these coprolites are the partially digested and pulverized bones of plant-eating dinosaurs. So we have trace fossil evidence here, we have the bite marks, we have the the coccolites, and we have the functional anatomy to reconstruct the way Tyrannosaurus could bite. In fact, people did computer modeling to look at the bite forces that a Tyrannosaurus could generate, and they are among the strongest bite forces of any animal ever evaluated. There's you know, one or two other creatures that might get up in that scale. Um, well, there was such a powerful bite, or an aspect of having such a powerful bite, is that the jaws are doing double duty. Not only are the jaws doing the eating, they're also doing all the killing. Uh, because right behind it, you have these tiny, dinky little arms. <laughs> uh, you go out there, look at Sue, her arms you know, not much longer than mine. Um, and you know, they can't even meet in the middle. It can't even scratch the middle of its chest. It can't pick its teeth with them. You know, it couldn't do anything with them. <laughs> That's why they were so angry. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, what were they used for? Uh, you know, I would say we did a lot of arm waving. And actually, that may be accurate. They may have been doing a lot of arm waving in that you know, there are some flightless birds with reduced wings that actually will still display with their wings even though they're no longer flying. So maybe they were displaying. Like, they probably couldn't fight like this because the real one, they'd actually have to be like touching chests in order for the claws to be. So we're not doing much with them in any case. Uh, thankfully, they didn't have to use the tools, otherwise they didn't 